thank you, Kalyana Varcha, uh, fellow order members. The invitation to give this talk coincided with my seven-year review as a private preceptor. And um, this review has truly been, I can honestly say, an unqualified delight. It's been characterised by a very high level of receptivity, mutual respect, meta and mudita. Um, for me, it's been a uh, very real uh, living experience of spiritual community. And so I wanted to dedicate this talk to all those people who contributed to my review, to whom I feel extremely grateful. And that includes, just in case they put themselves out of the picture, my correspondent and my husband. Um, so this talk is dedicated to those order members and mitras who contributed to my seven-year review and participated in that so wholeheartedly. Over two and a half thousand years ago, in the deer park at Isipatana, Gautama Buddha opened the door to the deathless. He opened the door to a mystery, to an awakened state of mind that sees things as they really are. We stand through time and space facing that threshold. To what extent are we willing to, to cross it? To what extent are we able to cross it? How fully are we willing to enter into the unknown, to course in the wisdom that has gone beyond, to dance with the dark knees, to hear and follow Gotama's guidance? Doors present us with a decision. We have to decide whether and when to cross the threshold. On the other side of a door is a future yet to be revealed, and therefore unknown and uncertain. In Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland, Alice falls down the rabbit hole and is confronted with, an alert and with numerous doors. She finds one which is only 15 inches high, uh, which, peering through the keyhole, she sees this wonderful garden, and she's uh, desperate to, to go into this garden. But in order to pass through that door, that 15-inch door, into the garden, she has to transform herself. And that's where all her adventures begin. In Ursula Le Guin's Wizard of Earthsea, Ged, the fledgling wizard, tries to gain entry to the school for wizards. He stands there and takes a step across the door and doesn't get anywhere. So increasingly baffled and angry at his inability to cross the threshold, he starts to try the, the spells that he knows, and uh, these don't work either. Eventually, he asks the doorkeeper for help, and he is asked for his true name. So Ged has to be receptive, honest, and ask for help to gain entry, ask for help to cross that doorway. Doorways therefore demand that we are receptive and open to what lies beyond. In order to cross the threshold of the door to the deathless, we need spiritual receptivity. However, there is not just one door, but many doors. There are many opportunities in the days of our lives to touch awakening, to hear the heartbeat of the Dharma, to see the light of illumination. And in this talk, I'm going to be exploring how spiritual receptivity enables us to cross, the, cross those thresholds. It is a process 
that I nearly always find surprising, uplifting and enriching. It can cause a wild joy, a gladness that disarrays, jolting us out of the narrow confines of our lives at that moment. A couple of years ago, I revisited the Victorian Albert Museum in London to look at their Buddhist art. As I was leaving, slightly disappointed, I have to say, my son noticed a doorway in the corner of the entrance hall and persuaded me to go and see an exhibition uh, entitled Shadow Catchers, Cameraless Photography. I found myself in a world exploring light and darkness, rupa and shunyata. I felt as if I was seeing the Heart Sutra sort of enacted before me in the images of a delphinium petal emerging from an almost imperceptible trace, gathering weight and deepening in colour until the petal was fully visible. It was an experience, it was a seeing before me of light being transformed into matter. And I was particularly moved in that exhibition by the work of Gary Fabian Miller. He is particularly interested in light and time, and he writes, When we are born, our brain is like a dark rock. Each day you live, it is exposed to the light, and thus it slowly fills with light, and the light accumulation becomes our mind and our thoughts. And each day's acts are precious as those acts work with the light to form the beauty and the intent and the integrity of our forming mind and the actions we choose to make in the world. So each day's acts must be treasured. Each action considered as it contributes to the light accumulation, our light deposit, our forming mind, the turning of the dark rock into a light-sensitive cell that radiates energy, and if carefully built, it can radiate goodness and beauty within the world. This is how I think the development of our receptive faculty works. As we become increasingly receptive, our mind becomes ever freer, lighter, and open. Uh, another way of thinking about this is that Fabian Miller is giving expression to um, our ability to dwell more and more in the greater mandala of aesthetic appreciation, which Vasantra mentioned yesterday. So we need to cherish our moments of receptivity, the moments of illumination, and we also need to hold ourselves ready for those moments. The poet Mary Oliver asks the question, who knows what is beyond the known? And if you think that any day the secret of light might come, would you not keep the house of your mind ready? Would you not cleanse your study of all that is cheap and trivial? Would you not live in continual hope and pleasure and excitement. Banti says that spiritual receptivity is of the utmost importance. Without it, spiritual progress simply cannot be maintained. Without spiritual receptivity, spiritual progress simply cannot be maintained. It's therefore crucial that we hold ourselves open to the truth as the flower holds itself open to the sun. This is what spiritual receptivity means, holding ourselves open to the higher spiritual influences that are streaming through the universe, holding the door of our hearts and minds open. 
In Initiation into New Life, Sabuti describes spiritual receptivity as an openness to the progressive trend in conditionality, whether arising in oneself or the world around. One who is spiritually receptive responds to ethical virtue, to purer and more refined states of mind, to insights and experiences that come from beyond self-clinic clinging. Whatever individuals, symbols, images or teachings embody or exemplify the progressive trend will evoke an answering appreciation, devotion and emulation. Something within oneself will resonate with the ideals encountered without. I think of spiritual receptivity as our capacity to respond to Kalyana, to the good, the true, the beautiful, and also to that which is mysterious, inconceivable, ineffable, the deathless. It is our capacity to go beyond the surface, surface of things, to notice the extraordinary in the midst of the ordinary, to see over our shoulder, to catch a glimpse out of the corner of our eye, to hear the voice in the silence. It is the realm of imagination, of art, of poetry, of devotion, of meditation, the realm of meaning. It requires us to suspend our willed effort and allow for something new or different to arise beyond our conscious identity. We need to let go of expectation, become quiet, attune our minds, becoming wayfarers, wandering the pathless ways of the infinite, stravagers on the path of the moon, dawdlers in the garden of the law, idlers in the greater mandala of ascetic appreciation, dreamers idling into ourselves, By following tracks and unexpected byways, allowing ourselves to be entranced and captivated, we may gain passage into another world where we see the light of illumination, hear the voice of the Buddha in the silence, or feel the darkness breath on our necks. So how can we attune our minds to what is beyond? How can we keep the house of our mind ready, expectant for those, for those moments when um, in that very evocative image that Vasantra used yesterday, the sheaf of hay just falls open? Well, the opening verse of the Ratnaguna Samchayagata provides us with a useful set of conditions. Call forth as much as you can of love, of respect, and of faith. Remove the obstructing defilements and clear away all your taints. Listen to the perfect wisdom of the gentle Buddhas, taught for the wheel of the world, for heroic spirits intended. So, call forth as much as you can of love, of respect, and of faith. So, it's a bit of a paradox, isn't there, in, when we're in uh, receptivity. We have to be active initially. We have to set up the conditions um, in order to allow ourselves to be receptive. So there's this active um, aspect. So we have to, we need to call forth. And as much as you can, I really like this 
So the, you know, these verses are not saying we've got to be perfect. They're just saying at any moment, uh, call forth as much as you can in that moment. It's not like we've got to do it all now and we've got to be perfect. It's just doing the best we can at any moment of our lives. Uh, so we need to call forth as much as we can of love. Quite simply, we need to love the three jewels. We need to love the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha with all our heart and all our mind. We need to be deeply, deeply interested and wholeheartedly engaged with our practice. And we need to have a strong desire and a lively curiosity about our growth and the growth of our Sangha. We need a strongly developed awareness of reality so our connection with reality is fully alive and at the forefront of our minds. The wonderful writer Robert McFarlane, who is um, interviewed in the current issue of, of Arthona, as an exemplar of a truly receptive spirit. His passion and love is for the land and landscape. He has a profound awareness of the land and the conditions that have fashioned it. He writes on breaking open a stratum of mica, which is that um, very shiny, silvery uh, rock. I lifted and the rock opened and there between two layers of grey rock was a square yard of silver mica seething brightly in the sunlight. Probably the first sunlight to strike it in millions of years. It was like opening up a chest filled to the brim with silver, like opening a book to find a mirror leafed inside it or like opening a trapdoor to reveal a vault of time so dizzyingly deep that I might have fallen headfirst into it. The hallmark of a receptive encounter is that our understanding or our experience is extended or heightened. We are changed by the encounter. When I become enveloped in McFarlane's love, understanding and enthusiasm for the land, my own re relationship with the earth and with landscape is broadened and deepened. So secondly, we need respect. We need respect for ourselves, and for that which is higher than us. And I think part of this is taking ourselves seriously, taking each other, taking the Buddha, the Dharma and Bhante seriously. In the Vajrasattva Sadhana, there is a point where Vajrasattva speaks. It's very easy to fall into superficiality at this point in the practice. Well, I find that. Um, you know, just saying the words. But actually, this is the voice of reality speaking. So I need to be fully alive and really curious about that encounter and the potential in it. Um, really take the words to heart and the potential that is there in that moment. You know, this is the voice of reality speaking, which is very mysterious, but I need to really let that soak in and be enveloped in it and allow something else to happen. Um, so we need to, you know, we really need to respect the sorts of conditions that we already have, I think, and and be curious uh, about how that all works. You know, how does Vajrasattva speak? So all a bit of mysterious. Anyway, 
Another example, Banti says, the teachings contained in the Dhammapada are literal truth and they deserve to be engraved on our hearts in letters of gold or fire. Now, how seriously do we take this aphorism? It's a very strong statement indeed, and Bhante always chooses his words carefully. Out of respect for our teacher, and if we want to cross the threshold to the deathless, we would do well to take it to heart and allow those great, beautiful, uncompromising verses that are contained in the Dharmapada really become stamped, engraved into our beings. That is the kind of uh, thing that we, you know, we just need to be engraving the words of the Dharma into our being. Now, I'm just using the Dharmapada as an example, but uh, you can substitute your own favourite text. But we really need to sort of, I think, bring as full of, as respect to, to the sort of conditions that we've already got in our lives. And the things in a way that we already know and just need to take further. And then we need Shraddha, faith. A deep, abiding faith and confidence in the three jewels. A deep longing and a profound yearning for awakening, for the truth, and believing that we can progress. We need faith that if we are receptive, then the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas will respond. We can be sustained by the grace of the Buddha. We see the very highest expression of this in the story of Pingir, who you will remember says, there is no moment for me, however small, that is spent away from Gotama, from this universe of wisdom, this world of understanding, this teacher whose dharma is the way things are. I recently had a glimpse of this because um, in Sheffield we inaugurated a new rupa at our centre in, on, on uh, Buddha Day. And ever since then, um, I've had a very, very strong sense of the Buddha's presence in Sheffield. It, it's as though, um, this might sound almost fanciful, fanciful, but anyway, it's as though Shak Buddha Gautama has arrived in Sheffield. Um, our uh, main shrine room is about 60 or 70 feet high, so it's a very it's a big space, and um, our new Rupa uh, hole sits in that space. And the centre is also on a sort of um, rocky outcrop, so it's quite high above the city. So I just feel that uh, Buddha Gautama is floating above the city in, in Sheffield, um, having an influence. Uh, he's a still point in this mad world. And for me, uh, a sort of anchor almost, when I bring, bring our Rupa sitting there in this uh, space. It's a reminder of awakening and a finger pointing at the moon. So we call forth as much as we can of love and respect and of faith. And we then remove the obstructing defilements and clear away all our taints. So we need to keep our minds as clear, limpid and serene as we can, dealing with unskillfulness as quickly as we can. The main barrier to receptivity, as Vasantra put it so well yesterday, is the ego project. We just need to let go of the ego project hold ourselves lightly uh, and let go of its attendant mental states of fear, worry, pride, doubt, selfishness. 
think other barriers that we can encounter to receptivity include habit, where we just go through the motions with half our attention or maybe even a quarter of our attention on what we're doing. Um, one order member I know develops his capacity for receptivity by consciously looking for the familiar, uh, sorry, for the unfamiliar in the familiar. So he goes on, a, on the same walk most days, and on that walk he, some, he consciously cultivates um, an attitude of looking for the unfamiliar, looking for the unexpected, looking for what's different. We can also look at things from a, from a different perspective. You know, we can, uh, if we're looking at a tree, we can allow the tree to see us, or, you know, we can just change our perspective, change, change the way we're doing things. So, um, yes, I think habit is one, of a, is another barrier to receptivity, as is busyness and a prosaic utilitarian attitude. I find it very hard to be receptive um, in my current working conditions in the NHS, which are uh, very, very sort of utilitarian, really, become more so. Um, so, yes, we need to um, avoid getting too caught up with the prosaic utilitarian attitude and avoid let go of fixed, rigid views any thoughts, any sentence that begins with should, must, ought, never, just beware and um, do something about it. So we need to remove the obstacles to our receptivity. And then we need to listen. Listen to the perfect wisdom of the gentle Buddhas. We need to listen with care, with attention, with full awareness. Listen to ourselves fully and honestly without editing or closing down options. Listen to others, to our friends and fellow order members. Listen to the Dharma. And above all, perhaps, we need to listen to the silence. And in that silence, we can discern the voice of the Buddha. As Bhante writes in The Voice of Silence, For when the senses and the sensual mind are laid asleep, and self itself suspended, and naught is left to strive for or to seek, then to the inmost spirit, Thrice refined, thrice pure, before that trance sublime has ended, with voice of thunder will the silence speak. And finally, we need a heroic attitude to be receptive. Receptivity to the truth will turn us inside out and upside down. We need to be willing to go beyond ourselves, to walk into the unknown. It is important, though, to remember that the unknown is not meant in the sense of alien. Um, it's not a strange, unnatural, outlandish unknown. The unknown is inconceivable. You know, we don't know, we don't know what it holds or what it's going to mean for us or what its effects will be. But we are aligning ourselves with the way things are. And therefore, we've already got a resonance with how that is and a recognition of where we are heading. So although... Um, you know, we might be surprised or taken aback, we might be dismayed by what happens. There's actually, we're not on sort of, it's not an outlandish, really alien sort of thing. So I think it's really important to make that point, actually, 
Because we use these words, don't we? Words like unknown, and we can have a sort of uh, resistance. I'm not sure if I want to go into the unknown. So it is unknown, but it's, it, we have a resonance with where we're going. So, um, yeah, we need to sort of recognise that. Um, and we do need to take risks. We have to be willing to cross those thresholds. And we have to accept that we are likely to be amazed or dismayed. We have to be willing to give up what we've become so far. In The Inconceivable Emancipation, Banti says that rather than trying to appropriate a higher experience as something to be incorporated into your existing being, what you should be doing is incorporating your existing being into the experience in such a way that your existing being is transformed. I know that I try to appropriate experiences into the existing structure of my being. I construct a bigger and better self based on ignorance and delusion, adding on qualities and behaviours that I'm attracted to, rather than allowing experience to transform me. It's, as though I, it's almost as though I put on a sort of whole new bodysuit, but the self underneath is kind of trying desperately to stay the same. So I'm just sort of putting things on, adding things on and, and trying to keep things as they are. Uh, whereas what we need to be doing with experiences is, is opening ourselves up to them and allowing ourselves to be disarrayed, thrown into confusion, and then reassembling ourselves in a slightly different way. In the Vimalakirti Nadesha, we find Manjushri agreeing to visit Vimalakirti to inquire after his sickness, sustained by the grace of the Buddha. Commenting on this, Bhante makes the intriguing observation that Manjushri embarks on this visit without any fixed idea. He is going to deal with the situation spontaneously, which means that he is not even going with a fixed idea of acting spontaneously. So I've always found this a bit difficult to uh, get my head around, really. But I think the Sandra last night in the um, Meta, just sitting, which we preceded by the Meta, he kind of guided us very skillfully towards that sort of point, didn't he? Where. Um, we, he, in, that, in last night, uh, Vasantra was encouraging us just to let go of all conceptualizations or constructions and just allow metta, just the, just, there was just the presence of metta. I think it's the same with Manjushri. He is just purely sustained by the grace of the Buddha with no sense of what he's going to do. Uh, and uh, so he's just poised within the grace of the Buddha, and then able to enter into that encounter with um, Vimalakirti. So, um, yes, so we need that courage to let go of those ideas about ourself or about how we want something to be or what we're going to, how we're going to do it. We just need to have the courage to increasingly let go of um, all those views, ideas, uh, constructions that create and make up our ego. So love, faith, respect, purity, sensitive listening and courage are all conditions which enable the development of our receptive faculty. And I think the um, opening verse of the Ratnaguna Samchayagata gives us a very useful framework and a really good aid memoir. You know, we can just bring that to mind very easily uh, as we go about our lives, uh, calling forth, you know, just getting into the habit, calling forth as much as we can of love and respect and of faith, and then just letting go, 
letting go. And as our capacity for receptivity grows and develops, then more of our lives is lived within the greater mandala of aesthetic appreciation. More and more of our being will be carried by the progressive trend in conditionality and by Dharma Niyama processes. Everything that we do becomes imbued with meaning and we are vitally alive to the nuances and influence of the truth and beauty present in each moment. We live in hope, excitement and pleasure, confident that at any moment we could enter the door to awakening and willing to do so. We have faith that our actions are contributing to forming the light deposit of our minds. And so our minds increasingly become um, energy sources, radiating good, the true and the beautiful in the world. The other day I was doing my weekly vegetable shop, uh, which is a very regular occurrence. Um, and I was at our local greengrocers thinking about fruit and vegetables that I needed for the week. Suddenly, my attention was caught by um, these absolutely gorgeous yellow plums. Um, and I immediately thought, this is the colour of Shakyamuni. So that was entirely sudden and unexpected. I was not thinking, I was, as I say, I was thinking about vegetables. <laughs> I wasn't thinking about the Buddha. Um, but the effect of, of that was I just felt joyful and uplifted. My awareness of reality was strengthened for that day. Um, I felt closer to the Buddha and now I shall always connect these yellow plums with him. So ever since I've seen them since, I just immediately think of Shakyamuni. Um, I think it was an example of, uh, again, of this sheaf of hay. You know, there I was kind of caught up with vegetables. And suddenly it just all falls open and there I am with Shakyamuni. I think that's, that's kind of how it can work, isn't it? You know, it's like, we just set up these conditions and then things, whoops, come along and swipe us. Um, yeah, when we have deeper and more profound encounters with reality, whether we experience dismay or amazement, we need to savour, relish, cherish those experiences, dwell with them, surrender to them, reflect on them and allow ourselves to be transformed so that we become more and more aligned to the way things are. Earlier this year, I was reflecting on the first two verses of the Dharmapada. I asked myself, um, is my experience preceded by mind? So to start with, the result of my investigations seemed to be going very smoothly, and yes, the Buddha did seem to be <laughs> right. Um, uh, yeah, and then I hit a bit of an obstacle. Um, I'd taken my son a short drive two miles across the city to an amnesty tea party, which he was involved in fundraising for. I had a piece of cake and a cup of tea, drove the two miles home, and got out of the car and was in a really, really bad mood. And I couldn't account for that. I couldn't account for anything in my mind that had seemed to be aversive or, uh, yeah, it seemed like this had come out of nowhere. So I wondered, well, was it because I sort of had this big hit of sugar? But then in that case, if it was sugar, that's physiological and that doesn't... Um, agree with, you know, what the Buddha said, which is that our experiences are preceded by mind. So this was quite an obstacle, really, because clearly uh, 
you know, I tend to think that um, Shirk Muni's right and I'm wrong. But um, anyway, I've puzzled over this for quite a long time. I mean, you know, several days or more. Uh, I was very curious about it and um, interested in it. And eventually I realised, somewhat to my humiliation, that I'm a far more critical driver than I allow. So in those short two miles back, there had been several frustrating incidents with dozy Saturday afternoon drivers and <laughs> a particularly frustrating roundabout in Sheffield, which is set for pedestrians of whom there were a lot and not for cars. So what I discovered was actually there's this almost unconscious critical voice going on when I'm driving, uh, which I was, uh, yeah, disappointed and a bit humiliated to discover, but also relieved in a way. So actually, that's why I arrived home in such a bad mood. It was because, um, it, it was because of what was going on in my mind. So the Buddha was right. Buddha is right. Uh, experiences are preceded by mind. Um, so yes, we really have to, you know, dwell with and reflect on our experiences and uh, sit with them until we resolve them, until we reach a point of integration or assimilation. Uh, yeah, allow ourselves the time to, to do that. Um, I think this is particularly important as well with the experiences that we have on retreat, which is very easy to forget. Um, so, you know, I think we really have to refer back to things that have happened to us and really allow them to, to, to enter deeply into ourselves, to really sort of soak in those encounters that we have um, with reality, with what is beyond. So, so far I've been considering the conditions that we need to develop our receptive faculty. We can be receptive in all areas of our life, meditation, friendship, our appreciation of beauty, uh, both in art and nature. Vasantra, uh, and yes, and Vasantra yesterday gave us a very clear and eloquent framework for the just sitting practice. Uh, I just want to finally, or in, just uh, look at in a bit more depth, uh, how our experience of ritual um, can help us be receptive, or how we can be receptive uh, in the context of ritual. So I think that uh, ritual and devotion is one area of our life where we can consciously practice receptivity. What we're doing when we um, take part in a ritual is that we set up the conditions and then we just have to let go, be receptive, be open to the experience, allow the impact of the ritual to affect us. When we participate in ritual, we never know quite what the impact will be. So we need to hold, hold ourselves ready and open. Open to receiving whatever is going to emerge. Picture this. A few weeks ago, five women sit at the feet of the Buddha drinking tea. The atmosphere is still and the room beautiful, lit by the golden radiance of the Buddha. Vivid red geranium petals are at the Buddha's feet and on the tea table. An elegant, gracious mistress of ceremonies pours tea from a cast iron Japanese teapot. Space and time dissolve. 
All the cups of tea I have ever drunk are somehow contained in this sacred moment. Such a commonplace activity as drinking tea is suddenly lifted into a new realm of meaning, of wonder. The communion the participants share as mothers, as dharma farers, deepens with the stillness as they sit in the presence of Shakyamuni. I had no idea I would be so profoundly moved when Mokshalila and I planned to have a tea ceremony as part of an event for parents. We had planned the ceremony with care and attention And there was a high level of harmony and trust among those who were participating in the event. But in the moments of that tea ceremony, something else happened, which I don't have words for. It was an experience, an opening into a deeper and more profound realm, which touched us all and moved us all. So ritual, I think, you know, is a very, a very um, strong vehicle for for um, being receptive, for, for 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 spiritual receptivity. And our collective devotional practices provide also provide very good conditions for that. In particular, um, I think the sevenfold puja is an exercise in receptivity. It's a progressive movement through various spiritual moods from worship to self-transcendence. I think of it as the theatre of the spiritual, a multiform, utterly obedient to a mystery. It's a vehicle through which we can transcend ourselves, connect with the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, glimpse awakening, give birth to the bodhicitta. And I think it's an extremely important practice for the development of spiritual community. However, like anything we do, our engagement in puja can be affected by the ego project. So I would suggest that if we find ourselves resistant, lukewarm, superficial, distracted in our responses to puja, We have a duty to ourselves and to each other to work with that so that we can each bring as wholehearted and receptive a state of mind as possible to our collective practice. It is such a precious opportunity uh, when we practice puja together and I think it's one that we simply can't afford to miss. We need to bring, when we're we're, um, performing puja, we need to bring a heartfelt longing for awakening, a yearning to go beyond ourselves, a belief that this experience can change us and a desire to dwell with the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas to experience shunyata. The more we can do this, then the more we'll be carved anew by our devotions. Our community will be enriched and sustained increasingly by Dharma Niyama processes, by the grace of the Buddha, by the Bodhicitta. I'm sure some of you watched the um, opening ceremony of the Olympic Games. So the conclusion of that ceremony was the uh, lighting of the Olympic cauldron, I think it was called. So that involved, there were 200 individual copper petals on a horizontal plane, uh, which were lit by the Olympic torch. And then those petals all very gracefully and elegantly rose into the air and were combined, united in this one great flame. So I immediately thought, well, that is the most wonderful symbol of our order 
and also of the potential that exists in Puja. You know, there was last night there was these beautiful uh, sea of flames from our individual nightlights. So it's as though each of those individual nightlights, you know, were all well. We are all connected. They are all connected. But you know, they were on stems and they just gradually rose into the air and formed one great flame. And I think what it is that enables those flames to rise into the air is uh, receptivity and going beyond self-cherishing, going beyond the ego project. Uh, so um, we can all rise up, transcend ourselves, be united in that great flame of bodhicitta, and this is what I'll, you know, this is what I believe we can do in our practice of puja. Uh, and it's absolutely crucial that we do it actually, because uh, the um, <clears throat> keeping a live spiritual community in the world today is a very um, important task, and uh, it's up to us to do that. So. Um, Yeah, so that's, you know, I think our, our collective devotional practice have that potential. Um, and, uh, you know, I would hope that we all bring that sort of um, aspiration to Puja when we, when we do it. Uh, because I think it's, it's, one of the, um, it's one of the most tangible ways in which we can all be receptive and in harmony together, creating the conditions for spiritual, uh, for, for spiritual receptivity, for um, creating the conditions for the arising of the bodhicitta. Uh, so finally, um, on the topic of ritual, I just wanted to uh, make the point that bringing a ritual element into daily life can also enhance our capacity for receptivity. So my mindful walk to work is enhanced if I imagine myself walking on lotus flowers in Sukhavati. This experience, just by imagining it actually, the experience is both mindful and uplifting. But sometimes, I am transported, and the rest of my day is perfumed with the scent of Sukhavati. This isn't something that I can will into being. Uh, again, it's uh, you set up the conditions and you just let go. It's the mantra, isn't it, of um, spiritual receptivity, set up the conditions and let go, let go. Uh, Yes, so I think, you know, um, bringing a ritual element, engaging our imagination in our daily lives um, is another way that we can uh, enhance and develop our capacity for receptivity. So by creating the conditions for receptivity in our lives, and I've suggested that the opening verses of the Ratnaguna Samchayagata give us a useful framework for this. And then crossing the threshold, moving into something beyond us, beyond our ego project, whether it's in meditation, ritual or friendship, we strengthen our receptive faculty more and more of our being comes to inhabit the greater mandala of aesthetic appreciation. We increase the illumination of our mind. We are forged anew. We become more familiar with unknown paths, increasingly confident in our ability to wander the pathless ways of the infinite, until ultimately we shall cross the final threshold to the deathless, to a fully awakened state of mind. Thank you.